welcome back to the last session of today, intrusion detection and prevention. So let's see what we've studied so far. We looked at the basics of cryptography. Then we looked at security protocols. We looked at software security, malware, network security, and now finally intrusion detection and prevention. So intrusion basics. An intrusion is the act of gaining unauthorized access to a system or resource so as, not, so as to cause loss, harm, theft, etc. What are examples of intrusions? Unauthorized logins, installation of, software, of spyware into a victim's computer, or infection of a machine with a worm or a virus. So these are different examples of intrusions. How do you deal with intrusions? Usually dealt with by a combination of preventive measures Detection followed by an appropriate response. But what distinguishes prevention from detection? So any examples here of prevention? Sorry. Um, closing all the open ports. Yes, closing all the open, all the open ports, only leave some open at least? Uh, some, I mean okay. service which, apart from the service that you host. Okay, so which ones do you want to keep open? Yeah. HTTP, for example, okay. 25. So just check what Google keeps open. So I think they, you all did the experiment. I think it was uh, HTTP and FTP. We just did a scan on the Google uh, server, and they kept open at, at least these two ports, right? Were there more or just two? HTTPS and HTTP, not FTP also. Okay. So one thing is uh, to, prevent, uh, to prevent attacks, Try to keep as few ports open as possible. Only the least things that you want, just keep those open and keep everything else closed. So that's an example of prevention. <coughs> Any other examples of prevention? Firewalls. Firewalls, to prevent stuff, okay. So you to prevent intrusions, you just uh, write rules so that only these kinds of packets can enter, not some other packets, etc. So like that, you, it would be a nice thing to go through different examples that you could possibly list of prevention and detection and see which ones are this and which ones are that. And are there any other handling techniques that are neither prevention nor detection, but possibly things like recovery preceded by forensics, etc. Prevention anticipates various kinds of attacks and takes steps to forestall their occurrence. Examples include the use of encryption to prevent eavesdropping. So I know that somebody is going to eavesdrop on this line. So before that happens, I encrypt all my messages. And code auditing to minimize the chance of a buffer overflow or an SQL injection vulnerability, for example. So I thoroughly audit my code using some good tools so that any such occurrence can be eliminated. Intrusion detection system. So we talked a little bit about prevention, now what about detection? First an IDS, so the key things over here, the key verbs are monitors, analyzes, and alerts. So somebody asks you, what is an IDS? What is it doing? Three things, monitoring, analyzing, and then sounding an alarm or an alert. First, an IDS monitors events of interest. Now, of course, what is this event of interest? Occurring in the target system or in the network. An event of interest may be the opening of a file containing sensitive data. Now, the only problem with this is you can start monitoring every single thing that goes on, and then you have huge amounts of data. So that is not a very uh, good idea because you'll have a lot of false alarms, for example, and stuff. So you have to be very careful about what are your events of interest. And IDS generates a large amount of data, which it then analyzes and converts into valuable information. So from data to information. Valuable information to be used by system administrators. Now that's where you can use all your wonderful machine learning techniques and AI techniques and so on in trying to analyze this data and making sense of this data. Based on all this data, do I see that there might be a DOS attack or do I see there might be a certain worm attack, etc. An IDS raises an alert, an alert each time it observes anomalous or suspicious behavior. The IDS should be capable of learning, so that's where the AI machine learning comes in the picture, should be capable of learning what is normal behavior, detecting anomalous events when they occur and flagging such events. So what is exactly meant by normal? Is this the normal number of logins per day? Is this the normal uh, number of TCP packets that have come in, et cetera, et cetera? So I have to establish a baseline 
And whenever I find something goes very high or very low compared to that baseline, then I take action. So the first thing is monitor. Monitor various system or network variables. Analyze the recent value behavior of variables. So analyze so that you can find the norm. Then any particular value or behavior matches an attack pattern. So does this match an attack pattern? What is exactly this attack pattern that you're trying to match with? There is a database of these patterns and you're doing some kind of signature matching. Any guesses? Matching what? Behavior of a particular virus. Yes. So the, you said behavior of a virus. So you're trying to find, for example, if there's a virus that, virus that has been unleashed into your system. So the most basic thing is to search for a sequence of bits, because as we said before, most of these things actually contain assembly code. So you search for this pattern of bits, and if there is a match, then you conclude. So this is what I mean over here. The value of the behavior matches an attack pattern. So have you found this? Yes, then raise the alarm or alert. And no, the other kind of intrusion detection, there are two of these, anomaly detection and signature detection. No, then you look for anomalies. Is there an unusually high number of TCP packets coming in, for example? An unusually high number of ARP response packets, and so on and so forth. If so, raise an alarm. So this is exactly what one of your IDSs would do. So for example, to distinguish between prevention and detection in the context of passwords, passwords should be strongly stored securely, not written on sticker pads, and should not be communicated to friends, relatives, and coworkers. So this is prevention of password, password abuse. Store it securely, don't reveal it to anybody, don't let anybody seeing you type your password and so on and so forth. This will prevent password abuse. Now detection of password abuse, an employee has for 10 years never logged in outside of office hours, say between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Today, however, this user logs in at 4 a.m. This should cause the IDS to raise an alert. So this is detection. You find something very strange happening, and then you try to take remedial action. So prevention, a prevention measure, a preventive measure, and a measure involving detection. Another uh, example of the two, we've just seen this in the morning, uh, buffer overflow. Now to prevent it, make the stack non-executable, prevents at least one class of buffer overflow problems. So I mentioned over here one class. Is this, uh, this, will it prevent all buffer overflow problems, making the stack non-executable? Is there a buffer overflow problem which doesn't involve executing stuff that is written on the stack? There is, and it's called the return into libc bu uh, buffer overflow attack. Return into libc, the libc is a C library. So what you do is, you just have a call to the system uh, system call, the system library call, and you pass the appropriate parameters. The parameters are on the stack, but the code is not on the stack. You actually use the code of the system call, and you can still launch a buffer overflow attack. So making the stack non-executable, to some extent, prevents buffer overflow, but not in every case. On the other hand, detection. Again, we had seen this morning an example of detecting buffer overflow using the canary the so-called stack smashing attack. Using a canary value on the stack detects a buffer overflow and thus helps thwart its possible exploitation. So here I'm detecting, I'm not preventing it, but I'm detecting. I see that that canary value has been changed just before I exit from that subroutine and I conclude that there was, that there was a stack smashing attack. Okay, some of the key questions. What are the different types of IDSs? What are the variables that the IDS should monitor? When should an alert be raised? When should an alarm be sounded? Where should the IDS and the organization be placed? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So some of these questions, for example, um, what variables should it monitor? Now, when you think of designing an IDS or any system for that matter, you ask yourself how well does it perform? So what do you think are the figures of merit for an IDS? Say I design an IDS, how am I going to evaluate my design? When I design a microprocessor or I design a piece of software, I look at functionality, I look at reliability, I look at security perhaps, and so on. When I design an IDS, 
and I'm trying to sell these ideas to the world, what, you know, how is it going to be evaluated? How well it performs, for example, so what is the metric? Yes, exactly. So that's what I wanted, the accuracy of the ideas. So this is a key issue over here, the accuracy of the ideas. So the false negative rate and the false positive rate. So what's the difference between the two? So the false negative rate is, there is an attack and this guy never said anything about the attack. The attack took place, I was not warned and I've been harmed. So if this happens, this is a, this thing is a false negative. And if there are too many false negatives, we say that the false negative rate is very high. So this is very bad. The not so bad thing is false positives, but it's very irritating to the system administrator to have too many false positives. What are false positives? The attack is not taking place, and every time I'm being told there's an attack, there's an attack, there's an attack, to the point where I'm just bored and I'm just, uh, you know, endlessly uh, interrupted from my work because I'm being told there's an attack, but the attack doesn't take place. This is called a false alarm or a false positive. So the false positive rate and the false negative rates are two measures of the accuracy of the ideas. And of course, another measure is the speed. As I mentioned before, there was this code red scanning worm, internet scanning worm code red, and the faster I'm warned about it, the better. As soon as you can warn me, at least I can patch the machine or put the IIS server off. So the, I, uh, the IAS, I mean the uh, IDS, should, be, should have enough speed besides accuracy. So here are some sample variables. The login frequency to a particular account. I monitor this. And I've got support to monitor this. There are different kinds of logs in the system. There are firewall logs, operating system logs, application logs, database logs, etc. So I, I observe the login frequency to a particular account. And if it's unusually high, I suspect there's an uh, attempted break-in into the system. This guy is, uh, is trying to log in quite a few times. Of course, the system will try to stop him if he logs in too many times, let's say five times and they're all uh, unsuccessful attempts, typically the system should stop him. And it stops him, but then again, after 10 minutes, he tries again, and so on and so forth. So then there's something suspicious, because I see my operating system logs from the same account, there are so many attempts to log in. Then the percentage of half open TCP connections. Half open means the SYN packet has reached, and you've sent the SYN plus ACK packet, but you've not received the third packet. And I'm seeing many of these half open TCP connections. I'm suspicious that it's possibly a DOS or a DDoS attack. Then TCP header flags. I see all kinds of funny combinations of TCP header flags set. I suspect that the, uh, the attacker is trying to do operating system fingerprinting. So anybody knows what this means? How do I look at TCP flags and suspect that there's operating system fingerprinting? Uh, Ritu Bala had mentioned when she was talking about the Nmap uh, demo that you can also do besides you besides figuring out the hosts besides figuring out which ports are open you can also figure out which operating system and which version is running so the the trick is you send a tcp packet with some weird combination there are six flags in the tcp header like sin fin reset etc you set some illegal combination of flags and send it to this system now tcp is implemented as part of the operating system Different operating systems and possibly different versions will react in different ways. So some might send you a reset message, some might send you a fin message, some might send you something else, some might not respond at all, etc., etc. So based on the response, you can figure out this operating system did this. This operating system did a send a re reset packet with a reset flag on. This other one sent a packet with a fin flag on. This one didn't do anything. And thereby you can conclude that it was probably this operating system on the host this version. So that's operating system fingerprinting, where you send a lot of these TCP packets with different header flags on, different combinations of these flags on. TCP connection establishment uh, to an unused destination port. Why is this guy looking at port you know, 48 and port 79 and so on and so forth? Does he really want to do something or is he doing port scanning? So attempt to find which services are open. Then payload of the incoming packet. I find a specific sequence of bytes in the packet. And that tallies with what I've got in my database of signatures, worm signatures. I suspect it's a specific worm attack. Then I look and see that there's a sequence of operating system calls that this foreign software has executed. I suspect that this looks like the signature 
of a particular worm or a mutant of a particular worm, a certain worm family. That worm family, op, you know, executes this operating system call followed by this one, followed by this one, etc., etc. So that's another signature for worms, not just a bunch of bits, but also a bunch of operating system calls. Actually, the new worm signature is a graph of operating system calls. You have a full graph, maybe of 200 nodes, where uh, there's a link connecting operating system call A to operating system call B if there's a dependency between the two. That is, A produces something, say a handler, that B uses. So this is a new kind of signature for worms. It's called behavior-based malware detection. Um, there are two dimensions of differentiating these things, anomaly-based versus signature-based, and network-based versus host-based. So what's the difference between anomaly-based and uh, signature-based? Anomaly-based intrusion detection involves making a determination whether the behavior of the system is a statistically significant departure from normal. So the first thing that's done, and it's a difficult thing to do in general, is to uh, set up the IDS and train it to understand what is normal behavior. So the IDS will have to learn over time what constitutes normal activity usage and behavior. Unfortunately, the definition of what is normal may vary as a function of time of the day or day of the week. What is normal for 10 o'clock at night may not be normal for 10 o'clock in the morning and so on. What is normal may also vary from one host to another. What is normal on Sunday may not be normal on Tuesday, etc. Signature-based idea. Signature-based intrusion detection, also called misuse detection, works by identifying a specific pattern of events or behavior that portend or accompany an attack. Such a pattern is called a signature. So what is this worm signature, for example? A specific sequence of bytes. But you can't really rely on that completely because of, you can't just say that code red worm every instance will have this sequence of bytes. Because worms could be polymorphic and they could be metamorphic. So you can fool the uh, antivirus product by creating polymorphic and metamorphic worms. A signature-based IDS maintains a database of known signatures. It attempts to obtain a match between the currently observed behavior of the system and an entry in this database. So what is the sequence of operating system calls? Does it match with some sequence that I've got stored in my database? If so, then it means it must be this particular virus. A real-world signature-based IDS will have thousands of attack signatures against which to compare. A network-based IDS. An IDS that captures information about packets flowing through the network is referred to as network-based. An example of the information captured, number of half-open half TCP connections, ratio of ARP request to ARP response packets, the percentage of HTTP packets, etc. So what exactly to capture is you need a lot of intelligence. And then how to use that information, you need even more intelligence. So the IDS is really something that is designed by experts. A host-based IDS, typically implemented in software and resides on top of the host's operating system. Its main job is to monitor the internal behavior of the host, such as the sequence of system calls, the files accessed, etc. Very much system variables rather than network variables. It makes use of system logs, application logs, and operating system audit trails to identify events related to an intrusion. So we just talked about this. An undetected intrusion is referred to as a false negative. An IDS generates a false positive if it raises an alarm, even though there is no intrusion currently occurring or about to occur. So two aspects of IDS accuracy. So some papers will talk about the sensitivity and the selectivity of an IDS. As you can guess, high sensitivity implies a low false, positive, uh, false negative rate, high sensitivity. So it's very sensitive, it has detected all these intrusions. So a low false negative rate. While high selectivity implies a low false positive rate. I'm very selective about what I say. I don't just say it's a false alarm and it's not actually a, you know, an alarm. So that's high selectivity. One nice kind of IDS-like device is a honeypot. So honeypot is a closely monitored network decoy. What is this word decoy? A decoy is like a trap that you lay 
Say, for example, you're trying to trap a tiger. There's a tiger roaming around in this place, in this uh, land, and you want to trap it. So you put a decoy, you put a goat or something, tie the goat or a dog or whatever to a tree. So the sound of the goat or the smell of the goat will attract the tiger in the night. And then when you see the tiger, you can immediately uh, trap it. So that's a decoy. So the same thing you're doing with a honeypot. A honeypot is a closely monitored network de uh, decoy. You plant it somewhere into, in your system. It distracts the adversaries from more valuable machines on a network. So the first thing is, um, somebody is trying to at, uh, attack your network. Hopefully, it will see the honey pot. That's why it's called honey, actually, because it's very sweet and so on. They will be very attracted to the honey pot, and they will try to attack the honey pot instead of uh, instead of attacking some of the sensitive machines on your network. Not only that, so the honey pot is like a phony kind of thing. So it it attacks the honey pot, and then you. Uh, get all the viruses and other things that have attacked this, and then you analyze those things. Analyze who sent this, what was inside this, et cetera, et cetera. Which IP address did it come from? So it distracts the adversary from more valuable machines on a network, provides an early warning about new attacks and exploitation trends, and allows in-depth examination of adversaries during and after exploitation of the honeypot. So you deflect the attack deflected from sensitive machines to this honeypot. And then, of course, you study what has happened to this honeypot, who has come there, and so on and so forth. Many new worms will first enter into the honeypot, so you can immediately capture them and see what the whole payload looks like, etc. Another person says it's a security resource whose value lies in being probed, attacked, or compromised. So it's like the opposite. You don't want something to be attacked, but in the case of the honeypot, you're most eager that somebody attacks it, so that you can find out more about the attacker. Now, some measures to handle DDoS. So there are different kinds of measures in different places. It could be in the host, it could be in the network, etc. So packet discarding is one. Syn cache, syn cookies, egress filtering, distributed route filtering, various detection techniques, and then finally handling it through IP traceback. So the first and very simple approach Cat categorize the IP addresses, that is the source IP address. Uh, so you're receiving packets. Now which packet to allow and which packet to uh, discard? Categorize the IP addresses as almost certainly genuine. So if it's almost certainly genuine, you allow this guy to come in. Probably spoofed, you be a little careful, and so on and so forth. So you just give them different grades. The guy you really trust, the guy you don't trust at all, the guys who are halfway in between, and so on. Under moderate load, Load conditions allow all incoming SYN requests to be entertained. So when there's very little load, fine, no problem. Everybody can come in. Even if they perform a DOS, it's not going to be very serious. But then when the load increases, you have to be much more cautious. Under rapidly increasing load, packets with unfamiliar source addresses are discarded with high probability. The disadvantage is collateral damage is possible. So can you think of an example where this might, be, might happen? You have an e-commerce site, for example, and there is very high load. Should I discard packets with all uh, unfamiliar source IP addresses? There was just an advertisement about my site on television. So everybody wants to visit my site. They've just heard that I've got a new product and everybody wants to buy it. Now many of these are first time buyers of, uh, at my site. Should I discard them? No. So what I'm doing is I'm actually hurting myself in the foot this is called collateral damage. Collateral damage is a military term used when your own soldiers by mistake fire on your own soldiers. That's called collateral damage, okay? So unfortunately, I'm hurting myself because potential customers to my site have been um, prevented from proceeding. So you're discarding all the packets from new customers, which is not a good thing at all. So that is one approach. Another is handling DDoS via SYN cookies. How many of you have seen SYN cookies? What is the idea of a SYN cookie? So let's see, it's a simple idea and it's implemented in many operating systems today. The responding machine places a SYN cookie in the sequence number field of the second handshake message. The cookie is computed, so it's not, an, it's not a you know, constant number. It's computed as a hash function of the source address, destination address, source port, destination port, and a secret. The initiator of the connection dispatches the cookie it just received in its ACT message. 
Upon receiving the act, the responder recalculates the cookie and verifies that it matches the value enclosed in the received act. Only then does it reserve buffer space for the connection. Okay, so you choose a random number for, choose a random value for the sequence number in the second message of the TCP handshake. And as you very well know, the sequence number has a direct relationship with the acknowledge, acknowledgement number in the subsequent packet. So you put that number random and you just see whether the guy sends it to you within a reasonable amount of time, the initiator. If he does, then he's a genuine guy. Otherwise, the possibility is that it's a spoofed packet. So this is a send cookie and you can enable it only when you sense there is a lot of traffic and there is a DDoS, the onset of a DDoS attack. Is this clear or should I explain it again? The idea of a SYN cookie. So you choose a random number, which is actually a pseudo random function of the source address, destination address, source port, destination port, and some secret. And you put that value inside the, so that secret also will change over time. And you put that value inside the sequence number field in the TCP header. So the initiator sent a message, the responder is responding, that is the server is responding. So you put that value inside the sequence number field and you wait for some time to get that value. Now what happens is the attacker will use the spoofed address, he will not be able to see that cookie because it goes somewhere else altogether. He will not be able to respond with the third message. And then you, you time out and you just reclaim that memory space, etc. So this is the idea of a SYN cookie. As I said, it's implemented on all modern operating systems. The other simple idea is that of a SYN cache. While a connection is in the half open state, Minimal information about that connection is stored in a hash table called the SYN cache. So typically you would store something like four kilobytes or so for each connection request, that's the buffer size. But right now don't, uh, don't allocate so much space, just leave only about, uh, sorry, um, 300 bytes, not four kilobytes, 300 bytes. But right now, because you've not completed the whole connection, just leave about 40 bytes or so. So you don't waste too much memory space. The minimal information that you reserve includes the TCP sequence numbers. How large is the sequence number? Sequence numbers and act numbers. 32 bits. So reserve 32 bits for that, 32 bits for the act number. Source port, how many bits for that? 16. Source port, destination port, IP address. Just reserve that minimal information, which will take how many bytes? Maybe around um, 20 bytes or so. 20, 30 bytes. That minimal information includes the TCP sequence numbers, source destination addresses and ports. Reserve only that much space for an incoming connection. And only when you get the third message, do you reserve the entire 300 bytes. So a full buffer of about 300 bytes for a given TCP connection request is allocated only upon completion of the three-way handshake. So this is the idea of a SYN cache. You just cache the connection parameters and then you allocate the full 300 when it's completed. Egress filtering, another measure now. So this is not at the host. The other two things, SYN cache and SYN cookies, were at the host. This is somewhere in the network, your own network. DDoS attack packets typically contain spoofed IP addresses. The egress router is the last router encountered by any packet generated inside an organization's network before it enters the internet. If the source IP address of an outgoing packet does not match any address in the organization's network, the egress router drops the packet. By thus detecting and filtering spoof packets, it helps prevent DDoS attacks. So the idea is very simple over here. So this is the network of your organization. This is the egress router. This is the last hop before it enters into the internet. Okay, so this is the subnet and then this is the internet. So what you do is every single incoming packet that you see, Everything that goes to the internet will go through this egress router. You look at the source, uh, source IP address of each of these things. And if you see that it's an address that doesn't belong inside this domain, then you discard that packet. It's probably a spoof packet from somebody inside this network. So that gets discarded. Because as I said before, most of these DOS and DDoS attacks used spoofed IP addresses. So this is one way of preventing any kind of spoofing of IP address. If the source IP address of an outgoing packet does not match any address 
in the organization's network, inside the organization's network, the egress router drops the packet. By thus detecting and filtering spoofed packets, it helps prevent DDoS attacks. So this, uh, these words are interesting. Detecting and preventing in the same sentence. By thus detecting and filtering spoof packets, it helps prevent DDoS attacks. Interesting uh, use of those two words in the same sentence. You are detecting spoof packets and thereby preventing DDoS attacks. Okay, distributed route filtering. This is another research idea that has come up. I don't know whether it's actually implemented, but somebody from, I think it was Purdue University, came up with this idea some years ago. DRF is an extension of egress filtering to routers in the core of the internet. So now notice where we have gone. We started with uh, handling strategies in the host, then we went to your own network, and now we are going to the core of the internet. So DRF is an extension of egress filtering to routers in the core of the internet. A DRF-enabled router maintains for each of its interfaces the set of all source addresses from which packets arrive en route to some destination. Now, as you very well know, a routing in IP looks at the destination address. Over here, you're looking at the source address, and you're seeing this is the source address. Therefore, it, must have, it should have come from either this, this, or that. If it doesn't come from there, you discard it. The filtering decision is straightforward. If a packet with source IP address is equal to S arrives by an interface that should not, it should not have, that packet is assumed to be spoofed and is hence discarded. Let's try and understand what this thing means. So probably a good example would be to take some cities. Everybody's familiar with this. Shall we take something in the center? Let's take Agra. Anything to the south of it? Gwalior. Is that correct? More or less? Okay. We'll just take different directions. New Delhi. Jaipur to the west. Okay. And uh, I guess Kanpur would be southeast. Something here, southeast. Kota. Kota. So let's imagine this is a router and it's getting packets from different directions. As looking at the source port, do you think it would be okay, what would this guy's reaction be if he sees the source address being Mumbai and coming from the link from New Delhi? Something weird, weird right? What is going on over here? Mumbai is somewhere there, and how can you approach wherever you're going, say you're going to uh, Kanpur, why would you be going from Mumbai over here? In general, this is not this doesn't make sense. If you were coming from Mumbai, you'd probably coming, be coming from, say, this link or this link perhaps, or maybe even this link, but probably not from this link or this link. So that's this idea of distributed route filtering. It's an extension of uh, egress filtering. If the source address is Mumbai, then you must have come from, you should be coming from here, most probably from Kota. But if there was congestion on some link over there, maybe you took a little detour and you came through Jaipur, or you took a detour this side and you came through Gwalior. But certainly not, I don't suspect you came from Kanpur or uh, you went through New Delhi and so on and so forth. Okay, so I just look at the source and it discard it. So what I say is, if it is Mumbai, it should be either this or this or this. If it's coming from there or there, I discard it because most probably it's spoofed. So that's the general idea. So the filtering decision is straightforward. If a packet with source IP address is equal to S arrives by an interface that it should not have, there's no reason for it to come from New Delhi, that packet is assumed to be spoofed and is hence discarded. Okay, so that, that much about some handling strategies. Now what about detection? Now here's where you can use a lot of statistical stuff, forecasting stuff, and so on. Monitor the number of half-open TCP connections a half-open connection is one for which the first message of the TCP handshake has been received by the server. The second message has been sent, but the third message has not yet arrived. So you monitor the number of half-open connections. If this number or the percentage of half-open connections exceeds a certain threshold, then you suspect that this is the onset of a DDoS attack. So you, statistically, you can come up with some very nice algorithms to do this. Just as a SYN packet is used to establish a TCP connection, a FIN packet, so another little algorithm, 
Uh, everybody knows that when you establish a connection, use a SYN packet. When you terminate the connection, use a SYN, use a FIN packet. I mean normal termination. There are terminations with reset also, but I'm talking about a normal termination. So just as a SYN packet is used to establish a TCP connection, a FIN packet is used to terminate it. If in a given time interval, so whatever the time interval, you have to design that. If in a given time interval, the number of SYN packets greatly outweighs, greatly outnumbers the number of FIN packets, then a DDoS attack may be underway. Instead of looking only at the current interval, so that interval may be too small, look at the last few intervals to determine whether there has been a buildup of SYN attack packets. So how many intervals you look at, what is the size of the interval, what are the thresholds, all of those things has to be very cleverly, intelligently figured out. Then another aspect of handling this thing is, from the law enforcement point of view is, sort of like forensics, is IP traceback. So I'm trying to detect it, I'm trying to prevent it, first prevent, then I'm trying to detect it. Uh, I'm trying to handle it at different levels, at the host, within the network, at the egress router, at the routers in the core of the internet. So many, many, many different, very rich area. Now what about IP traceback? I want to know who's behind sending those spoofed packets or the guys that are behind it. So the source IP address and DDoS attack packets are typically spoofed. Hence, we cannot rely on their source IP addresses to determine the subnet from where they came. Instead, we attempt to identify the path or the paths traversed by the attack packets. This idea is known as IP traceback. Now, there are two principal approaches to IP traceback. Either the packet keeps track of the routers it has visited. This is termed packet marking. Or each router keeps track of the packets passing through it. This is termed as packet logging. So can you just think of a way, suppose you have to design a way for this packet marking, how would you do it? So the idea is you start at some point, this is the place which is bombarding you, and you receive these attack packets, and you're trying to figure out where this thing came from, what is the path? So here is one suggestion in the literature, can you somehow put a chop on the IP packet, in the header of the IP packet, in the IP header? which might be a good place to write something. So the average hop path, the average hop count on the internet is about 10 hops. Now, one thing I cannot do is I cannot take this uh, packet that has started over here. This is the source of the packet and this is the victim. Clearly, I cannot put a 32-bit quantity by each of these guys. I mean, my header is only typically, what is the IP header? Typically, how many bytes? Five. Five, five, five. five bytes? Five 32-bit words. Sorry, five? 32-bit words. Very good. Five 32-bit words, so 20 bytes typically. And each IP address is four bytes. So if I'm going to put four bytes of this guy's thing over here and so on, this is going to be very, very large. And obviously, it's not a very good idea. I would like to do that. I would like each router to be designed such a way that it puts its chop on this thing. So then if I get this packet finally, and I look at whoever's put its chop on it, I'll be seeing this guy's address, this guy's address, and so on. But that's not very good because the header gets large and you're just wasting bandwidth. Can there be a smarter idea? Can you think of anything that can be done? There are many, many suggestions, but let's look at the simplest. Basically, what is the problem? This is the attacker. Let's assume for the time being, it's not even DDoS, it's just DOS. He's attacking and he's got some spoofed IP address. So this is the source of the attack and I'm the victim. And here is my suggestion that I use this thing called packet marking. So I mark something on these packets. Basically, the identity of these guys. My problem is, I can't put four bytes of this guy, four guy, bytes of this guy, all their addresses, because this will get so large. This is already 20 bytes. And if the average hop count is 10, then I'm putting something like 44 times 10 or four times nine. I'm adding greatly to this header. That's not a very good idea. And I've got to change the entire IP protocol for that. So is there some way? The first thing is, if I want to put some kind of chap, the question is where to put it inside this header. So it turns out, that there is one field that is not used too much. Can you think of any field that is not used too much in the IP header? I think it's a 16-bit field. In the context of fragmentation, there is this ID field. 
which identifies, you see, if you fragment the IP packet, then all those fragments will bear the same ID number, so that at the receiver end, you can put them together. Now, that is not used too much, because these days, there is less need for fragmentation. So very often, that ID field is left blank or unused. And that's a 16-bit field. But now I've got another problem. It's a 16-bit field. And how do I accommodate all these IP addresses? I can't, can't even accommodate one of them. So anybody has a solution to that? Think about the good old hash, the hash function. Suppose I've got a hash of the IP address, and I've taken an 8-bit hash, for example. Hopefully, it doesn't collide too much. 8-bit hash, maybe I can put two of these addresses. And that's exactly what they do. They put only some of the addresses. So for instance, I can put a 16-bit hash, or I can put two 8-bit hashes in that ID field. So suppose I put one of those, one 16-bit hash, in the ID field, then I probabilistically put my chop on that field. So with probability p, I put it, and with probability 1 minus p, I don't. So as it's going along, I may put it, I may not put it. This guy may put it, this guy may not put it, and so on and so forth. So it's entirely possible this attack packet has gone over here, and it's this router that has put its chop on this packet, and this guy has put, uh, you know, overwritten on that chop. So I see this guy's name on it. Then it might be the case that in the next packet, it may be this guy put a chop and this guy put a chop, but nobody else. So ultimately, if I collect enough attack packets, I will get a good idea of the path from where this is coming. Of course, assuming the path is fixed and it doesn't keep varying all the time. So that's this idea of packet marking. So the packet keeps track of the routers it is visiting. And this is called packet marking. The other approach, which is the opposite, is each router keeps track of the packets passing through it. This is termed packet logging. Again, this looks very fantastic. How can you look? You're seeing you know, gigabit links. You're seeing so many, many, many packets per second. How can I keep track? What sort of data structure uh, should I design so that I keep track of every single packet that has come to me? Again, there are some very nice solutions to this. So first, packet marking, what I just said. The IP header has no provision for keeping track of the routers it has encountered. However, a 16-bit ID field in the header is employed over here. A router's IP address is 32 bits, hence the IP address is not used to identify a router. Instead, a global fingerprint of a router is used. This is a 16-bit hash of the router's IP address. To complete the story, probabilistic packet marking, an intermediate router writes its fingerprint, the 16-bit hash, value into the ID field of a packet's IP header with probability p. Now, p is again a design parameter. Note that it could overwrite a previously written fingerprint of a router closer to the source of the attack. Each ingress router has a map of all the upstream routers from it. To identify the perpetrator of the attack, the ingress router at the victim end will need to collect a sufficient number of attack packets that are part of the same flooding attack. Based on the value of the ID field in the collected packets, the victim can construct the most probable attack path. So this is one way in, in which law enforcement can figure out who is the perpetrator of this attack. Where is all this emanating from? The other approach is called packet logging. With packet logging, each router attempts to keep track of every packet that passes through it in, say, the last five minutes. So I cannot keep track of too much, but at least let's see if I can keep track of the packets that have come into me during the last five minute span. The average size of an IP datagram is 500 bytes. So the amount of space required in each router is absolutely ridiculous. It is one terabyte. So who's going to spend that much money to put one terabyte on each router? The space requirement can be greatly brought down. The details are in the textbook can be greatly brought down by the use of something called a nice, interesting data structure called a Bloom filter. So you can bring it down drastically from a space of 500 bytes per datagram to just something very close to about 10 to 12 bits per packet. You only need that amount of storage per packet that's coming in. And again, I'm only storing packets that have come into me, the router, in the last uh, five minutes. So then what happens is, when I've stored that information, here I am, the victim, I ask everybody, have you seen this particular packet? All those who are connected to me, have you seen this packet? So of course I know where it's come from, so the correct guy will say, yes, it's come from me. Then he will interrogate the guys further upstream. Have you seen this packet? Have you seen this packet? Have you seen this packet, etc. So that is actually the hash. They compute a hash of the 
content and so on. Have you seen this? So this guy, will, one of them will say yes. So this guy will say yes. I've seen this thing with this particular hash value. The hash value of the packet content. Then he will interrogate the guys further upstream. Have you seen this hash value, etc.? So one guy will say yes, and so on and so forth. And finally, they'll be able to trace back this is the source of the attack. So this is through uh, packet logging rather than probabilistic packet marking. So these are two approaches that have been greatly studied in the literature. And also you've got hybrid approaches, which are a combination of the two. We've talked a lot about DOS and DDoS, but what about the challenges in worm detection? So one of the big things is, I've got a database of worm signatures, but uh, what happens if there is a zero day or zero hour worm? Everybody knows what is a zero day worm. I've never seen this thing before. If I've never seen it before, it's been unleashed just yesterday. My uh, antivirus product doesn't have this in its signature database. Now what do I do? How can it detect this thing? So that is one challenge. How does one detect a new worm that has never been seen before? A database of worm signatures will almost certainly not contain the signature of the newly unleashed worm. So this is a serious problem because new, uh, new versions are being created all the time. The next thing is speed. Efforts by humans to detect internet scanning worms could take hours, as we had seen before. This is clearly unacceptable in the case of worms such as Slammer, which spread across much of the internet in just 15 minutes. And then the other thing that I mentioned, and that is non-monomorphic uh, non worms, polymorphic or metamorphic worms. Detecting such worms is not straightforward since multiple instances of the same worm may not contain the same substring. So what you do in these worms, as I mentioned, is that the payload is encrypted. So when I'm seeing this thing going through the internet, all these routers and all are seeing it, they see different bits, different sequences of bits in different instances of the same worm. So what is the solution? So one solution, this is again one of the modern things that is being done, is what's called behavioral-based malware detection. Dynamic behavioral-based uh, malware detection. What it does is it captures that entity. You suspect something that's come into your organization is a worm. I don't know, it's all polymorphic and so on. I put it into a secluded, isolated environment because I don't want it to create trouble. So in a sandbox, and then I execute the thing. And when it's executing, guess what I look? I look for its behavior. What does behavior mean? How do I capture behavior? Basically, the worm has to make operating system calls. It has got to, for example, write into another file if it's a virus, write itself into another file when it wants to spread, or set up a TCP connection to infect somebody else, and so on and so forth. So I monitor the system calls, and from the sequence of system calls, it's not even the system sequence, but it's a graph of system calls. From the graph of system calls, I'm able to deduce which species it belongs to. So there might be a total of 10,000 different worms, but many of them are mutants of the same worm. For example, there might be 100 mutants of the same worm. So that's how I figure out all those mutants will have the same operating system graph. Okay, this graph is a graph of dependencies. That is, A has to take place before B takes place, and so on and so forth. So uh, there might be only, there might be say, 1,000 mutants for each species. So my signature, my database signature, signature of uh, my database of signatures will have only, for example, 100 entries. Each entry will correspond to 1,000 variants. So this is the idea, and I can very easily see now, based on its behavior, whether it's this worm or some other worm. So that's basically this whole thing on IDS and IPS.